Hello, and welcome to the OPSC. Um, this is the online peace science colloquium. My name is Cassie Dorf. I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, and I run the OPSC with Brad Smith, also at Vanderbilt University, and our, our awesome graduate assistant, Jennifer Barnes. So today we have a really exciting paper by Margaret Foster, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the paper is entitled Subject to Change, Quantifying Transformation in Armed Conflict Actors. We're also joined by three wonderful discussants. Uh, we have Chris Blair from the University of Pennsylvania, who's joining Princeton in the fall, Chris Ferris from the University of Michigan, and Vito Durazio at the University of Texas at Dallas. So um, we're excited for any of you who are joining us live. Thank you for joining. You're welcome to to give feedback or ideas or ask questions using the Q&A feature of the webinar. I'll be checking that out some, kind of keeping an eye on it. And when there's a moment in our discussion to bring up some of those questions, I will. If we don't get to your questions or just feedback and ideas directly in today's hour long discussion, I will send them to our presenter. So we'll hear from Margaret for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll go right into our discussion with our discussants and get a conversation going. Um, thanks everyone for again joining today and thank you for our discussions for being here and thanks to Peace Science for supporting this very fun uh, activity that we have regularly. If you want to learn more, you can check out the website we have online. It's easy. It's just the Google Peace Science online colloquia um, and figure out what pulls up from there or you can go to the Peace Science uh, UNT website. And with that, I think we can get started. So Margaret, if you'd like to take it away, you can. Thank you very much for the invitation to present to the uh, Peace Science Offset community. Um, I'm here to present Subject to Change, a strategy for quantifying transformation in armed conflict actors. Um, and I'd like to open by talking about the motivation and positioning this project within my research agenda. Um, so my dissertation and now book project looks at how um, and when do organizational changes follow from recruitment shocks. Um, and especially I'm interested in when bottom-up changes to the demographics of, of a membership base kind of result in preferences of the organization re um, reflecting the preferences of the membership base rather than what the top leaders have, have claimed or you know, been working for before these new members. Um, and so as a concrete example, we have you know, sort of a number of state cases in, in various histories of mills and organizations of, of a big recruitment shock or inflow fall, resulting in claims that this had changed the organization somehow. Um, so this is a quote from Mustafa Hamid and Leah Farrell's book about the Afghan Arabs, which were the precursor to, to the global jihadi organizations, um, talking about how in 1987, their organization becomes, or you know, the precursor of Al-Qaeda becomes much more aggressive by um, following an influx of young, sort of more impetuous, brash fighters. Um, this is, you know, reflected about a decade earlier in uh, Mike, Michael Waldemarian's book about the development of the ELF in what is now Eritrea. Um, you know, and in 1975, he records this big influx of Christian youths flocking into the organization that had previously been um, a much more elite Muslim group. Um, and he reports that, you know, in 1975, the former leader escaped from jail and was stunned that the movement had been becoming reoriented towards the, the preferences of their new Christian base rather than um, the more urban Muslim sort of initial core of the movement. Um, there are other examples from elsewhere. So um, Eric Mosinger's book about the development of the FSLN talks about what he calls about what he calls the um, a constituent um, effect in which there there were three successive waves of new constituents into the FSLN in Nicaragua, which created you know separate ties to constituents and their own distinctive preferences. You know that he says you know tore apart leaders and challengers, um, and you know was really quite destructive for the FSLN. Academics as well have talked about how bottom-up change is driven by personnel, or can be driven by personal and grassroots preferences. Um, so we have a lot of work on cohort effects, downstream effects of recruitment, socialization failure, and the consequences of that. Um, but the problem throughout all of these, these threads of research, um, including my own, is that it's very difficult to systematically quantify what change means in militant organizations. Um, existing approaches tend to look at in-depth case studies of specific groups or regions. Um, so for example, changes in Akim, AQAP, Hamas, um, the MNLF, 
or looking at transitions from one form of mobilization to another. So basically things that can be viewed externally. Um, and so this could be violence to nonviolence, um, others, others have conceptualized change through the introduction of new actors into a conflict setting. Um, so my contribution here is, is one strategy of creating or introducing at least you know, a first cut of a strategy to systematically quantify change by modeling the evolution in how observers report group activities. And I do this by taking the UCDB global events database, um, which I'll call the GED from now on, and I subset that to armed conflict actors with more than a certain number of events. Um, and then I, I take advantage of the fact that the database includes the source articles that are used to code the violent events of the GED records. Um, I then take these group specific source articles and I, I do an analysis of the text within the articles you know, after doing some sort of pre-processing, like removing words about reporting processes rather than activities. Um, I model each of these, these actor specific corpuses with a two topic topic model that I allow to vary by year. And I run this independently for all groups. And so the idea being is that that gives you a group specific model of trends and how they're being discussed in kind of a unidimensional uni scale setting. Um, you know, so to, to look at this, I take each group, I pull the sort of articles, I estimate the topic model, which is a, a statistical analysis of the text. Um, and then what I do to, to quantify change is I aggregate article topic proportions by year. Um, so what the text model does is it says, you know, each article is expected to be from one, one side of the scale or the other. Um, and then I aggregate that to what are the proportions of reported activities? How do they lie, fall on each side of the scale? Um, and then you can identify some sort of threshold of, to cut off as being what a, a change constitutes. Um, and then you go back and validate that with either case knowledge or UC encyclopedia or, or other reporting on the activities of the group. Um, so one point that I'll mention here that I'm sure will come up with in the Q&A is, is to why use an unsupervised unidimensional scale. Um, you know, partially is that the K equals two, so this is a one dimensional thing, loses a lot of potential richness um, and it forces all groups into finding this, this scale. Um, the part of the reason to use this unsupervised scale is that we want to discover different anchor points for each group, which will come out in the next examples. Um, and although two topics loses conceptual richness, um, you know, one is it's pragmatic. The themes are not all that expansive always. Um, these, these are often very short texts. Um, but, but the real advantage here is that by running this model in parallel with a, a you know, given specification, um, you can do so at, in a scalable way. Um, if you'll excuse the using of scale in two different forms. Um, however, the approach is flexible. So if you have like a really compelling reason to need non-two-dimensional, non you can do that. Um, although with a qualification that using more dimensions makes the change points much more subtle to identify. Um, and it's very resource and time intensive then to analyze what you're finding after the fact, which kind of steps back from the benefit of being able to identify this across you know, all GED groups of above a certain threshold of activity. Um, so concretely, what does this look like? This is an example of a motivating case of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And I highlight it um, in large part because this is a group that is often identified as undergoing a strategic change. Um, they are initially kind of a transnational jihadi group fighting the Yemeni government. And then after about 20, 2015, 2016, um, they begin being very much embroiled in a local civil war, um, particularly against the Houthi insurgents. Um, but this becomes a, an internationalized, regionalized civil war. And what we can see um, in the highlighted points, so in, the, in this plot, we have you know, time across the x-axis. Um, each point is an article in the GED about AQAP's activity. Um, and they're placed on a scale from one to negative one um, with some jitters for visualization. And, points that are closest to the negative one scale are more predominantly pulled from the first topic, in this case one about kind of a, a regionalized security threat, and points that are closest to the one are pulled from the second topic, which is much more about militants targeting the Yemeni government. Um, and I've highlighted some articles to give a sense of, of what the activities and what the articles are being talked about um, and how they're being presented on each side of the scale. Um, and we can see a very clear shift in about 2014, 2015, um, in which the shift is, you know, partially you can just see, but also the, the dotted green line shows the, the sort of average, the yearly average across all of the, the presentations. 
Um, and in this case, after 2015, there's a complete flip in how they're being described essentially. Um, another example for a group that has sort of much more oscillation is Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. Um, and in this case, it's a group that is sort of very frequently presented as having these two tactical modes of operation, one of which is a more Islamist insurgent group, and the other is much more one that's driven by piracy. Um, and here we can see you know, these two different, different frames, um, one of which being you know, the one on the, the one scale is much more about kind of militant framing, um, clans killing soldiers, Abu Sayyaf fighters. Um, the other near the negative one side of the scale is more about in a piracy mode. It's about hostages, it's about beheading militia. Um, and we can see a sort of a, a transition back and forth as, as reporting of the group activity is, is switching back and forth um, during time periods that at least the UCDP is talking about as being periods of consolidation and then moving towards a more sort of piracy motivation um, and reconsolidation around um, around a, a more militant ideology. Um, and so, so that's, that's interesting. Um, and the question is, is it useful for anyone but me? Um, and so to show that this, this scale can be sort of possibly generally useful by political uh, peace science and political science scholars, um, I use it to extend um, a recent project looking at uncertainty in um, conflicts and whether or not increased uncertainty results in longer con uh, civil conflicts um, via reducing the tendency for the conflicts to terminate and making them more prone to recurrence. Um, so that is looking at Nelson Svensson's The Intractability of Islamist Insurgencies. Um, so their theory is that uncertainty about capabilities, pragmatism, and resources means longer conflicts that are more prone to recur. Um, and they model uncertainty via Islamist motivation. Um, and as I say at the time, there isn't really a, another good encapsulation of uncertainty. Um, and especially there isn't one that is time varying. And so what, my, what I do, and I use this, this measurement of change is to say that we, by, by using this change measure, we can actually capture the concept of uncertainty um, in, in a sort of more direct way than their Islamist motivation by looking at after change periods, um, which can either pick up under underlying changes in the group um, as well as uncertainty in general perception of, of a group behavior and motivations. Um, and so one of the things that I find is that um, I am you know, very, like so, so as I replicate this and I introduce three different thresholds of, of possible changes. Um, the first is that you know, we say that a group has had a change if they have in one year moved an absolute value of one on this you know, negative one to one scale. Um, and that represents a group you know, their average presentation in articles of in that year, moving about half of the length of the scale. Um, and I snap it up to say, you know, a, half, a change of absolute value of 1.5, which goes from moving from majority one end of the scale to majority the other end of the scale. Um, and then finally with absolute value of change of, of two, which means moving completely across the scale. Um, so that will be the AQAP example. And um, what I find is that I have, um, you know, this does contribute to, to their, their general, you know, it's, it's in line with their general theoretical expectations um, in that groups that have had a change period, um, particularly of one to 1.5, um, are statistically significantly less likely to, or they have, um, sorry, I'm a little bit off, off kilter. Um, so basically they are less prone to termination of a conflict if they have undergone a change. Um, and so what's, what I find to be really interesting is that the magnitude of the effect is approximately in line with, with the, the one about having an Islamist claim. Although if anyone is interested, um, the, the variables are, are actually very uncorrelated. Um, so it's not the case that Islamist groups happen to be more likely to experience um, change periods. Um, but one of the nice things about looking at this yearly change period is that you can pull out sort of more information. Um, you know, so the, the previous uh, slide was just a binary of whether or not a group has experienced a change period, um, which is kind of the more conservative interpretation of what you can do with, with this measurement. Um, but what we can do is, is also say like, let, let's look specifically at, at within sort of a, a time period, period or a varying um, effect. Um, so again, in this plot, I, I look at whether a change in the previous two years is associated with a re, um, 
increased risk or re reduced risk of conflict termination, um, which you might expect to see if what Changes is doing is actually picking up a tendency for observers to change how they talk about a group as the conflict is sort of winding to a close, but it's totally exogenous to behavioral changes in the group itself. Um, and there we find that they're sort of not precisely estimated. Um, another one is years from change. Um, and so one, one thing that might be, might be a, a concern is that maybe some groups change very early as they stabilize in how they present themselves and how observers view them. Um, but then, then the, the conflict continues for very long afterwards. Um, and that actually has, has both imprecisely estimated and sort of like an effectively no impact. Um, and finally, you can look at number of changes. And so, so this would be groups like, like Abu Sayyaf that I presented earlier that have a lot of periods of framing change. Um, and you know, that could pick up this, this narrative like in the Abu Sayyaf case of they are being, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to identify what the mode of operation is. Um, and in that case, that actually does sort of reduce the risk of termination. So, you know, reduces the tendency for conflict to terminate. Um, and so I'm actually over time and I'll, I'll go to the conclusion. So my initial, you know, the goal of this project is for an initial contribution of a large and cross group measure of change in revealed behavior um, by, by modeling how observers are looking at organizations and reporting on their activity. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about it is that the group level output is interpretable. You can go in and see what each end of the scale are um, and that they vary based on the group themselves. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I'm hoping that it will allow inclusion of group transformation into, you know, future large end studies of conflict, um, including hopefully eventually my own. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention um, and I look forward to having a discussion. Thanks, Margaret. That was really great presentation. And I also just wanted to, to see if you had anything you wanted to flag for our discussion uh, before we, we get some of the comments. Um, yeah, so I'm primarily interested in whether, okay, so, so you know, I, I developed this as, as something that I need for sort of my own research agenda, but I would like it to live. Um, and so I'd be interested in hearing whether discussants think that, you know, this is something that could be moved into, like moved into publication and, and kind of where to pitch it. Um, so I could see pulling it as like a full paper or as a research note. Um, or, you know, kind of a, the alternate would be like appendix 15 of my eventual yeah. book. And yeah, um, that, that makes sense. I would really love to hear sort of a, an idea about that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Let's get started with Vito. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Cassie, for inviting me. And thanks, Margaret, for that great presentation. I enjoyed reading the paper. Um, I really like the like idea of using these texts to measure like what the groups are doing and the changes like I like I like the whole idea of it um so and that, that particularly relates more towards like the the first part of your paper or the second part of your paper um was about the the replication and I maybe the other panelists would, would disagree with me I, I almost felt like the replication was selling the idea short and so like, um, like move, if you're thinking like moving forward, you know, you want feedback specific to like moving forward for publication. Um, <clears throat> I, I, and maybe you're doing this in, in like other parts of the, the broader project, but um, like I, I, I'd want to know more like what this measure can teach us about groups or group dynamics. Um, like, if, you know, for example, I know it was only to demonstrate the validity of the measure, but uh, I liked the, the, the section on the use cases quite a bit um, and the discussions that, that went along with them showing, you know, how these groups are changing, um, the topic changes and it, and it really coincides with um, shifts in uh, um, it seems, so this is a, actually a related question. It seemed like it coincides with shifts in like, like the types of act, like the types of people or groups that the group targets, and also the type of attack that the groups, the types of attack that the group conducts. <clears throat> um, so I was wondering if like there's if if that's like something about the measure that you've noticed, if that's primarily what it what it picks up on, or if there's other 
<clears throat> attributes and some of the um, uh, topics that go beyond like focusing on like who the target is and what the type of attack is. Um, so is, is there a, um, is, is, so, so, okay, so this is a question also, maybe it's just like a specific qu clarifying question, but about the source text. So the, the texts that you use are texts in the, in the GED, um, but they're not the full news articles, right? Or I, I, I don't know if you want to chime in now, or you could chime in yeah, later. Yeah, I don't know I, if you want. I actually will chime in because we do have an audience question on this from Andy Halterman, um, which is just asking a little bit more about the text and how much of the article's text is directly related to the armed group and how much of it is related to like maybe other stuff that's not as directly tied to the armed group. So there, he gave some examples of, you know, maybe the group keeps its same composition, but starts fighting a different group at some point, which would change the topic proportions. Does that matter for this model or does it not? Um, and I can kind of send you other parts of it, but I think this this question picks up, I think on exactly what Vito is kind of asking. And if you want to clarify that, absolutely go for it. Yeah, so for the most part, these are, are very short texts that are almost like, I think, headlines in the first couple of lines. Um, sometimes they aggregate a couple of very similar articles together. Um, there are some that are extremely long. Um, so I, I have somewhere ridge plots of, of the length of articles by group. The, the one about the Syrian militants tends to be very long. Um, and I, I think that it has a lot to do with the fact that GED, at, at least as my, my, intent, my impression is that they um, sort of didn't try to detangle who exactly is doing what because it was so hard to tell at the time. Um, and so there you have a lot of, of very long articles together about conflict in Syria um, that are then used to code violent events in Syria. Um, for the most part, however, they're very short. Um, yeah, and they're pretty much who, what, where, and, and often reporting metadata. Okay, cool. Um, and then my last, my last point is the three, uh, the three cases that you kind of highlight in the um, paper and that you showed in the presentation here seem to coincide well with like the, either the encyclopedia entry or like what we know about the group. And I was wondering if there are others that you may have found that kind of push back on or like contradict, you know, what we think we know about a group. Um, and, in, and in that case, you know, maybe your maybe this approach can tell us um, something new about a group. So thanks. Enjoyed it. <clears throat> so I think it's my turn. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so thanks for the interesting paper. Can you all hear me okay? Um, my my headphones, I forgot them. So I'm using the computer mic. So hopefully that's good. Um, so I, uh, I think I'll just jump right in. To I think it's an interesting measurement project and approach. And given what you asked, um, Margaret, about what you might do with it to make it sort of live on its own, um, that's kind of what I would focus on. I'm going to focus on with my comments. I think I, I could see like a technical paper um, where you pull in some of the stuff that you have in the appendix and you pull in more detail about some of the stuff that you talk about with your choice of a two topic model versus others. And the challenges with, um, I think you said, um, you know, subtle, the, like finding the shit that it's, it's, Finding evidence of change is much more subtle when the topics goes above two. Um, I think for people elsewhere to use this approach in, you know, with other content from other, you know, text-based sources, um, they need more like how to and sort of what are the um, costs and benefits of you know different technical choices um, with the model and what it can say. So that's I think that's. Uh, you know, I think that could be a technical paper um, if you if you wanted to put the work into doing that. I don't. I don't. So I'm not suggesting that you needed to, you would need to do that for this current paper, given the approach. But I think 
you know, um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff to learn um, from the approach. And I, I hope that you would, you will take the time to like put some of that stuff into, um, into like the main focus of a paper. Um, my one big um, question that I'll just pose, and I have some ideas on it, uh, on potential responses to it as well. So basically my, my view of this story is there's um, like a tactical focus, um, who did what to whom kind of discussion in the news stories. So the news groups cover group behavior and their tactics. And you can see that even in like the graph, the example plots that you showed in the paper and in the, in the slides today. So if the tactics change, then the content of the coverage should change, which is an assumption um, built into the approach. Um, but what if the group uses a mix of tactics? Um, I think in the first graph you showed with the, the change point um, from Afghanistan, it was pretty clear that the, the stories changed in content pretty completely. Um, and there wasn't much overlap. But in the second one, uh, the, the group from the Philippines, there was, you know, there was some mixing. There were still some, some of the articles were still talking about like piracy and beheadings and stuff. While some of the other stories were talking about the other things. So there was a much wider range of, even though there was the change and there was clearly um, a larger proportion of coverage of one set of tactic, one, ta one tactic group or, um, compared to the other, there's still this distribution. And so like that variance might also be sort of important to, to talk about and bring in in both your the current paper, but then also the, um, the, the technical one. And, and like, what do we do about it? What does it mean if there's um, like a, a change in that proportion, a meaningful change in that proportion, but there's still sort of a mix versus not a mix. Um, and I have some ideas on that. So what if, um, and then relatedly, um, I just had some, I was, I was curious uh, what you thought about just sort of, does the news coverage itself change? Like, what is it about the, these news agencies and how they report? Um, you, you mentioned some of this in the appendix too. Um, so I'll just stop with that. And um, I guess are, are we, we're gonna take more comments and then, and then answer questions. So I'll, I'll stop. I have, I, have few, I have some few more things that I'll, I'm happy to share and talk about as we continue. All right, and, and I'll pick up there. Just wanna say thank you again, Margaret, for a very interesting paper and presentation and to Jennifer and Cassie for, for organizing today. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. So I, I really love the, the big concept of this paper. And I think, again, it, it could like be a, be a really nice contribution to the measurement literature. The main contribution in my view is this simple scalable method for identifying changes in media frames or narratives about groups. And I think, you know, in principle, it would be possible to take what you've done with UCDP and apply it as well to like ACLID or to SCAD or any other data set where you have these kind of like article headlines attached to event observations for groups. Um, and, and I think that that would be like a really important contribution to the literature. So, so kudos for, for hitting on that. I think my first and, and probably biggest point is that I would just push you for more theoretical clarity on what exactly transformation is that you're capturing here. And, and this is a point that I think Andrew's question raised and that Vito and Chris also mentioned, but right, are the changes, changes in topics, you know, for some groups are coming from changes in, in actual group activities, targeting tactics, et cetera. For, for other groups is coming from a shift in observer perceptions of group behavior that are being reported in press accounts and, and so, right, I'm, I'm really kind of seeking more, more clarity about whether this is mostly capturing changes in actual group behavior owing to new strategies, new leadership, new resource shocks, or, or re, like resource shocks that groups might suffer, or is it a change in the media reporting environment on a group owing to, you know, just a general change in the information environment, change changing government relations with the group that then trickle down into press reporting on the group, or in some cases, it seems that you're also capturing just broad, you know, transformation of a conflict environment with, within which the group is operating. And, and so like in the AQAP case that you mentioned, 
my impression was more that it was, you know, you, you pick up the start of the, the civil war in Yemen between the Houthis and the Hadi government, and then Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is responding to kind of broader changes in their conflict environment uh, as a result of that. So it's kind of like a bigger, bigger than a group level shift. Um, so, so theoretical clarity there, I think, would would be useful uh, in in the paper going forward. Another point that you you address somewhat, like in relation to selection effects in the paper, is is just about like how the international media reporting environment is shaping the changes that you're detecting, right? Um, in particular, I was wondering whether it would be harder to detect changes in movements where media reporting is either stagnant and reuses the same old tropes and themes because of like inaccessibility or a restrictive press environment. Um, in particular, I was worried that like some of the, the like African groups in your, um, you know, that you talk about the LRA and the, the Ogaden National Liberation in front, they both exhibit very, very little change uh, over time. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's just because of like inaccessibility uh, and poor reporting environments in, in East Africa. Um, I had a, a couple of thoughts about how you might be able to kind of like probe that. So one would be, is article length correlated with observing transformation? If longer articles are proxying for more information about groups, and a more conducive reporting environment than length might be positively correlated with change. That would raise concern about these groups with short article lengths and little observed changes. Second might be to use the kind of geographic precision of GED events at the group year level and see if that's correlated with transformation. Because again, if lower geographic precision is associated with fewer topic changes, that might again indicate like a poor reporting environment. And so uh, also would would push you a bit there. Um, just before I wrap up, a, a, cute, a, a few other quick points. So you mentioned in footnote eight and in the conclusion that the transformation measure is strictly group specific because the topics are unique to each group and hence not comparable across groups. But I think you might want to kind of develop this point more in the text and, uh, and and flesh out what it implies for for like inference, you know, a benefit is that you have a group specific measure that makes validation easier. A challenge is that, you know, if you're capturing different things for different groups, then like a big broad descriptive analysis is, is going to have to be careful about interpretation. Um, another quick question is, could you clarify how you're handling periods of, of group inactivity and, and ceasefires and things like that? I walked away with the impression that the measure of transform transformation or topic proportion is implying transformation in the nature of violent activity, but not between violence and nonviolence, where violence and withdrawal from the conflict or outright collapse itself. Um, and so just, just clarifying that would be useful. And then one last point, if you, if you stick with the replication going forward, which I thought was interesting, um, it struck me that in, in Nielsen and Svensson's framework, uncertainty was more about like uncertainty regarding group capabilities and especially the likelihood of a group receiving transnational support. And your measure of uncertainty framing change is really capturing more like uncertainty about the long-term consequences of some major, but uh, like relatively non-script group shift. You're kind of agnostic about the nature of that shift. It could be from banditry to insurgency, but it could also be from insurgency to banditry. And it strikes me that the that like the direction of shift um, in terms of like whether a group's getting stronger or weaker um, matter matters a lot and in a way that bears on like the relationship between your argument and Nelson and Svensson's argument. Um, you might also want to think about like capturing uncertainty as something like the standard deviation of topic proportion rather than the annual change in the mean proportion. Or like you know, like zero on the negative one to one scale is kind of maybe more akin to uncertain uncertainty about you know group capabilities or something like that. Um, I have a few other smaller points that I'd be happy to email you or talk about later. But overall, like really love the project. Super interesting and and congrats. Thanks, Chris and Margaret. You're welcome to respond to what you think is useful to respond to to keep the conversation going, or we can also. Um, collect some more more feedback. I think that was really good. Good feedback yeah, that also you. hangs hangs together, which is always nice. 
Yeah, it really does. Thank you. Um, that that's all super super helpful. Um, one thing about the question about whether this is really picking up tactics um, and targeting. Um, to go through to my early notes, one of the things is that um, yeah, I did find that it is very often tactics and targeting. Um, in part, though, it's a little bit hard to tell. You know, probably I'll just go through as many of them as I can and see what these these are, are corresponding to. Um, but some of it is is the question of how you find transformation if you don't have a way to looking for it, um, and some of the sort of like more convenient keywords to use look at will pick up changes in targets. Um, so like oscillation, right? Like that's really helpful. Um, but that that almost always means tactics and targets. Um, one of the ones that's interesting is that sometimes you also get geographic location. Um, so so one of the cases is the PKK. Um, and now I think that that one, I, I looked at that one as, as a case for a group that was really hard to fit to this, this approach. Um, in large terms, I think it's a case that would be, um, you know, I'm not an expert in the PKK, but I, I you know, know enough about it to know that it has like had several different waves throughout its very long history. Um, so that would be one where you, you'd think that this, this two topic approach is, is particularly unsuited. Um, and so there, you know, look at what, what you find out if you expand the number of topics. Um, and when you look for the two topic approach, one of the things that it shows up with is, is this divide between being a rural Turkish insurgency and one that's located you know, sort of somewhere in, in the Iraq area. Um, and then that the sort of the Iraq theme picks up in, in the early nineties. And then again, in you know, the late 2000s or the 2011 onwards, um, which, which is a very distinct sort of geographic and, and very much like a, a sort of operational change in the PKK um, that is more geographic centered than tactical. Um, but yeah, on, on the whole, I think there is a lot that is about, um, it tends to be about targets, um, especially. Um, and so that kind of leads into these questions about other ways of, of thinking about the content of the articles. Um, so I think that this picks up both of the Chris's points. Um, and I wonder if some element of that is to look at, at sort of various text reuse within the different articles. Um, because if, if you're getting a lot that is, is the same concept over and over, um, then you should see a lot of reuse. Um, but also you would see that as well if it's, if it's really focusing on like very distinct operational keywords. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the things where it's, it's really, at least for what I'm interested in doing a little bit, like the, the, the idea of doing a supervised approach is, um, I think a little bit harder to implement in this context, but once you have the, the unsupervised scales, it might be worth going in to pull out some keywords and then looking at the frequency of those across time. Um, that's at least my first first take. Um, and so, if, but if, if I think you, you have all sort of suggested that you had thoughts on where to go from that, so I'd be really interested in hearing what you have, um, what you were thinking as well. Can I throw something out there? Yeah. Uh, how? <clears throat> so, um, so as you talk, I'm kind of wondering, like. This is something that Chris had said, um, and I'll leave it general because I don't remember who actually said it and it wasn't me. So, but uh, like, how could you use like a similar approach and also say something about differences in groups? Because it is group specific, right? Right. But like, could you use the same approach and say something different about groups? Because I think that would also be nice like to be, you know, if you could do something like that, you, it would be another way to make the use of this measure, like, te te like it can teach us more things then. What do you mean when you say, say something different about groups? Like, like, like use this to compare I groups, not just like thinking about change, but like thinking about like, I don't know how, how they're, their strategies are related or not related to each other. Um, okay, so so that sounds to me like my first take on what this would might look like is to take you know each group scale and then basically cluster them. 
um, do some kind of PCA or, or some cluster analysis and see if there's like distinctive um, patterns that show up within how groups are, are like being picked up in this way. I did a quick two finger on this because one of the comments that I that I didn't mention, but that that I thought about because I've done some work on like relationships between militant groups is like how independent these really are and whether you observe kind of like common clusters between ISIS and its affiliate network or between Al Qaeda and its affiliate network or even like rivalry might have the same effect right like Al Qaeda and IS competing with each other but like engaging in the same same sort of same sort of activities in this kind of like outbidding logic something something like that seems to comport with like the the dimension reduction approaches that you were, you were just kind of thinking about. One, one idea I had that I think might be helpful here is um, once you've run the two topic model on any group, you've essentially created group topic dictionaries and you could, exp you know what the words are in your group top in your two group topics. And then you can compare those essentially dictionaries across groups. And you can see like by group topic. And I don't, I mean, I, I have no idea, I have no hunch uh, at all about what you would find in terms of the overlapping use of terms. Um, but that would be a way to directly compare something that you already have from the model that could tell us something about it's, it might be more about the news source coverage of the group topic than the, the, the group itself. But I don't know, like that's, that would be really interesting descriptive information that you could add in that would allow for a direct comparison of, of groups, at least descriptively. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I can even see like the, the sort of like, you know, the, the abstract, you know, Islamist groups more likely to be described as, as Islamist or militant or something. And, and you might, who knows what you might find, you might find that there are certain like keywords that are associated with a type of tactical choice that many groups are doing. And you might be able to, there might be some more um, generalized dictionary that you can build based on what you've already, do, already done that you could then apply to all groups um, that might still allow you to find the changes within, within group, but then make valid comparisons between groups. I don't know, like this is, again, this is all just yeah, just, but I think you have a you have a systematic and principled way to begin because of what you have with the group topic dictionaries. Or, or like when 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 groups emerge, how are they like initially? What other groups are they like described in similar ways to? Because I imagine that's important when groups emerge. We don't know how to think about them, and so we probably use other groups that we think are like them to describe them, and so. Um, using what Chris is talking about here, <clears throat> you could see like most similar group. Yeah, that's actually really, really cool. Um, cause it's kind of one of the things that, that, you know, I, I've wanted to do for a while and, and have some theoretical thoughts on, but no empirical thoughts on is this idea that there's kind of, it, it, there's a lot of incentive for groups and observers to use heuristics when describing emergent groups. Um, you know, right, like, especially as you're, as you're ramping up an organization, it's under a lot of repression with a lot of resource scarcity often. Um, and like, you kind of need to find a pattern really fast so that you, like, you have to make fewer decisions. Um, and this would be, maybe not, again, you can't really look at like internal decision processes of, of leaders, um, but this, this gives out the same idea of, of are there ways in which groups are being described really early? Um, and is it sort of, is there a path dependency from that? And do these you know, kind of heuristic shorthands hold in, in the descriptive frame? Margaret, I just want to flag on this note. I was just at ISA and saw a paper um, by Janet Lewis that was about the really early stages of tactical choice uh, and sort of you know, what, what do groups do in those really early stages? Are they more violent or nonviolent? And how do they sort of shift towards one main set of, of tactics over another? And I think they use more than newspapers. So it could be kind of something in, interesting to check against. And it is gonna be a, 
from what I recall from the paper, it's going to be like released data. So oh, cool. maybe if there are some of these more niche data sets that are coming out, like Forge and like her work and um, stuff that's looking at these really early stages of rebel organizations, if they're not just using news stories, using maybe other kinds of sources, primary sources and stuff, you could you could sort of check to see and help us get a better understanding of this like what is the media saying versus maybe what is the group actually doing on the ground? Thank you. That's a great idea. Um, okay. Yeah, Chris, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, just it's, uh, it's stepping a little bit away from the, the question of like group formation and stuff like that, but kind of related in the sense of thinking about kind of like macro systemic processes. Um, I was also wondering if, if you observe things like a 9-11 effect where like all of a sudden in 2001 or 2002, like there's some broad media change in trying like to freight uh, to, to force like a terrorism frame on, you know, what were previously being considered like rebel or militant groups just because it's like suddenly what the media knows how to talk about. Um, I was thinking about that with with reference to the Abu Sayyaf case that you that you discuss in the paper, but it's kind of a similar point in the kind of like macro systemic processes. Yeah. So um, again, Abu Sayyaf is is a really good case where I think you'd you'd expect to see this. Um, right. I think it's a little bit hard because I just in the case of Abu Sayyaf. It's no one exactly knows what it, what's going on internally, and I think mean, there's a lot of a sense that they themselves are deciding to use these tools. Um, but it, it could be interesting to see if there's a lot of changes around 2001 um, that is is beyond Abu Sayyaf. Um, and especially, I guess it, it'd be interesting to see if there's kind of cases on on the periphery of various conflicts, right? Like if there's a Chechen example, um, if this happens as well in, in groups that, that very shortly thereafter pack up shop. Um, I think at, a, at, that, at that point decides that after 9-11, the, the context has changed enough and they start peace negotiations um, to see if there's a big shock then. Margaret, we have about 10 minutes left okay. or so, and I, um, you're welcome to say no to this, but I did think one interesting point that came up from multiple people uh, was, and it's, it's a little bit more back to like what your paper is doing right now and sort of less these other ideas about where else you could go with it um, was about how to deal with some of these media constraints. And I, I do wonder a little bit, you know, like if I was to read this paper under review, that would be a big question for me in, in part because there is, you know, there is evidence that when the media in particular are facing death or, or other kinds of threats um, for even reporting on, on different groups that the kinds of stories we get are, are different, are very different for, from when media are able to report more freely. And so I, I wonder a little bit about how you're thinking dealing with this. And I think it actually relates to the question you got uh, mostly from Vito about, you know, what is change really? Um, and, and others brought it up too, but should we be thinking about this mostly as what you're sort of saying so far in terms of about armed groups, like we want to know this information about when they make these big changes, but how do we separate that from, it could be media changes, it could be perception changes. So maybe that could be a useful area to, to talk a little bit more about, just, just an idea, but pulling some threads together. Yeah, so that's a really, that's a great point. Um, my first thought is, is to do this by looking at, at similarity of the top, of this, right, the underlying text themselves. Um, I think that, that Chris Blair's idea of also looking at, at how coarse the reporting of the, the, the violence is, is, is a really good insight. Um, because like I could see that if you, you have kind of both, right? If you have articles that are very, very, very similar and also in precise location, um, right? So that, that would be the, the strongest signal that probably what you're seeing is, like probably what you're seeing is, is very coarse, right? And so then it's not necessarily and in this case, this, this picks up a lot of the groups not changing, right? Like it's not that the LRA isn't changing, um, it's that reporting on the LRA isn't changing. Um, and so I think that, that that's something worth doing. Uh, or I mean, that's absolutely something worth doing. One of the, the, on the question about like whether there is, is a, a media reporting effect in terms of 
of pauses. Um, I think that those don't tend to show up in the GED because it reports on, on activities of violence. Um, but we could see if there's you no know, very long periods with, with maybe a thinning out of, of stories, right? So you could look at density of stories in a given year. Um, and if suddenly the stories become much less dense, um, start looking in whether that, that is the case that there's less activity um, or there's sort of indications that it, it's less available. Um, and again, that could be either either pulling in external sources for validation or they're looking at the quality of the reports of violence. Um, and I guess otherwise, maybe maybe you could tell me if you think that this would be convincing, is I wonder if there's a way to bring in something like, like a press freedom indexes or indices. Yeah, so um, the CPJ keeps a, well, it varies by country, so maybe you'd have to do a case study, but the Committee to Protect Journalists does record um, murders of journalists, and that, that seems like pretty coarse, but they have other sources on their website and stuff. Maybe there's something you could go down that path with. Um, so then, then basically create like a weight based on, on reporting availability. And so then the idea would be that there's there's kind of there's a, a group level measure. Um, and then I guess sort of in metadata along with it, you might have the group level scale, which you know, as, as Chris Price pointed out, is is a, is a dictionary. Um, and then information about kind of ex expected surety, right? Like pulling um, press freedom or reporter availability, pulling precision of conflict pulling precision you know to density of those articles um, and then you could you could look and maybe basically filter by like you know high short surety low surety so uh, i don't know i don't i think this is getting maybe a little bit like um abstract but but like your measure is like consistent with the information we have, like as it is currently, right? So like, I, I don't know about like adjusting the ID, the, the measure based on like the, you know, freedom of, of journalists or something like that, because like, it reflects, like, it, it kind of reflects the information we have about the groups, right? But isn't that like, is this about the group's real changes or is this about the information changing kind of question that you had earlier? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Right, I, I could see like, you know, sort of reporting, reporting a change measure, but then having like, you know, kind of like, like the, the quality of democracy measure, right? Quality of a reporting or expectation of, of quality of reporting. Mm. Um, which I mean, may actually, I'll, I'll check the GED that, that may be included in, in their metadata as well. Mm. Um, Things you could do to maybe assess sensitivity of the, 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 the topic model to um, reporting is um, you could look for, you could look at like the, the number of changes by source per year. Um, so like in years in which a change occurs within within group, um, how many changes, how many year changes are there by news agency? So is there some like news agency? Is there, it, presumably there's not that much correlation between all these groups activities. I mean, I know that there's probably some particularly within country, but probably less so between. So if you're looking at like that, maybe that measure could uh, give you some sensitive analysis. Another one I might be, and this would get it like, this would help you probe the sensitivity to length of the story. You could code first paragraph, you could code group, group first paragraph, group all other paragraphs and scale those two things separately uh, and see if the same change occurs. Right, and the idea being that all other paragraphs in the first are more likely to be 
contextual. Well, I, I, I don't know what you would find, but it's presumably the, the first paragraphs are structured in a particular way, but still is summarizing the general pattern that the, the more detailed information in the other paragraphs are getting. So there's a big divergence between what the first paragraph is saying and all the other paragraphs. That might that might be an indicator that there's this is more sensitive than we might like. If there's not much difference in the clusters and the graphs are the same and the, the change that the first paragraph, the all other paragraphs, and then the combined ones are the same, then that, I think that's that that would be good evidence that the you're not missing stuff in like the shorter reports, I think. That's just my hunch. Yeah, and I, I've done something a little bit different looking at, at conflicts in Yemen specifically um, that does pull much longer articles in the G the text I have for this. Um, and there I could look, you know, do a slice of the years that I have in, in common between the two projects. Um, and then do, you know, look as well and see what, 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 what is being found with these kind of different textual sources. Um, and then there I can very definitely do the first versus second paragraphs. Um, a couple more minutes left. If, if y'all want to kind of leave any final comments, please do. Uh, I think this has been really good discussion. Um, and then, and then we'll close, but, but briefly, cause we're, we're out of time, but y'all are all very smart. Thank you for coming. Any final I just comments? Had one, yeah. one quick one, which is not specific to your project, but is specific to the GED is that it's a shame that they didn't separate out Syrian insurgents into constituent groups because, right, that category, it counts for like something like a third of your events. And yet it's like Syrian insurgents represents hundreds of groups that are operating in Syria right now. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure like if you can do anything to to kind of disentangle that um, any more than than they have already. But you know, I would just be careful about the kind of like the big like Kashmir insurgents, Syrian insur insurgents, like where you can't tell which group is is responsible. Um, yeah. Going forward, yeah. Yeah, I, there, there's a reason I didn't highlight those very carefully, but I, I should probably you know do any analysis by including or dropping those. Um, it'd be interesting to see if, if it's possible to tweet it out. I assume that they just got overwhelmed, um, which I think is 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 reasonable given presumed bandwidth. You know, you looked like you were about to say something, right? You okay? I'm good, yep, yep. Still thinking deep about, <laughs> about this. That's good. Um, it's a great, well, really thought-provoking project. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, you, you can say that. It's a great, really thought-provoking project. Um, I'll put Cassie. Do my, do my ending spiel. Um, this is a great thought provoking project and we are so happy that you brought it to the OPSC. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, discussants, if y'all have more you know, comments or thoughts, please just send them directly to Margaret. Um, there was a question or sort of more of a comment we didn't get to from our audience. So I'll send that to you, Margaret, directly. And for all of you to know, or those that are watching, um, we do have another presentation on April 29th at 2 p.m. Central Time by Carly Wayne and Keith Schackenberg called Anger and Political Conflict Dynamics. So it should be good. Uh, please tell your friends to submit to the OPSC and please say yes when you ask, when we ask you to hang out with us in these discussion groups. So we, we, we like these groups and we appreciate your attendance. Thanks everyone. Um, see you next time. Good job, Margaret. Thank you all so much. These are, these are really phenomenal comments. So thank you very much. <laughs> Bye y'all.